with you today. Um, I, I agreed that the day before I went to the conference last week and knew that that was going to be a theme, uh, was to kind of really count the cost for Jesus. But I really do feel that I've got to share about gospel courage. Um, and I ask the question, what does the Bible teach us about courage? Uh, isn't it kind of really linked to our personalities and temperaments and our experiences, really? Um, and in what ways do you think we really need courage? Do we need to be brave? I mean, the guy from India, when he was speaking last week, said, it's funny, in the UK, when I'm staying in the UK, he said, I still hear UK pastors praying for parking spaces and thanking Jesus when they get one. And he said, I said, they're thinking, surely they're believing for more than a parking space. But you think, well, I've done that, and I don't want to. <laughs> when we read through the Bible, I guess many of us are doing that, as we read day by day, courage crops up a lot. 1 Chronicles 28 says, David uh, said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Deuteronomy 31, Moses, son of Joshua, said to him, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, I've commanded you, be strong and courageous. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard, stand firm in faith, be courageous and strong. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, and I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What he says, or Ephesians 6 verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. There's, there's, there's courage everywhere, either explicitly in the word or implicitly in the behaviours of those we read about in the Bible. And I want us just to have a little investigation into that and how do we receive greater gospel courage in our own lives. And we're going to pray at the end. I want you to keep your hearts open. I'm going to invite any who want to respond at the end for prayer. Be delighted to pray with any that want to be prayed for. Let's just pray right now at the beginning. Father, we thank you for what you're doing around the world. We thank you for such days of adventure, such days of advance. Lord, thank you that you are on the move on every continent on planet Earth. We thank you for what you're doing up and down and left and right, right across the African continent. We thank you for what you're doing across Australasia. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in China, in India. Father, we thank you for that remarkable courage in Pakistan. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing across mainland Europe, as dark and hard as it is. Thank you that you are breathing life right now across mainland Europe. We thank you for Turkey. Thank you for the church that's being planted one after the other as indigenous Turkish leaders rise up. Father, we thank you that as the days get darker, your gospel shines brighter. And we pray right now, Holy Spirit, for you to teach us about gospel courage over these next few minutes, in Jesus' name, amen. As we kind of think about gospel courage, I, I want to begin by encouraging us to think about what God's courage at work in us, by the grace of God, as Francis said when he contributed, the grace of God never stops working in us. It's not that you get to 40 and you think, oh, thank goodness for that, I soaked up a lot of grace while, while I had those formative years. Every year is a formative year when we're opening our lives to the Word of God. We can keep growing, keep uh, gaining more and more wisdom, more and more maturity, more and more courage as we open our lives to God. But what does God's courage replace in us? And I think if we accept that becoming a Christian is really kind of following Jesus with our whole hearts, being God first, being full of the Holy Spirit, we need to recognise that that does bring transformation. And that transformation kind of displaces our natural human tendencies without Christ. What the Apostle Paul calls the flesh, a kind of human experience. Like if, you, if you get born as a human being on planet Earth and never meet Jesus, you will live and exist. And some human beings are, are kind of successful in some things, some are successful in others, and then they die and they've had a human experience. But to be honest, the flesh dictates so much of what they become, their identity, their weaknesses, their, their kind of triumphs is, is so linked to who they are in themselves. But when we get connected to Christ, 
we are filled with the Holy Spirit and a new power begins to work in us that works the identity of Christ out through us so our behaviours become transformed. So all of a sudden, unlikely people in the kingdom of God can do remarkable things. You don't have to be an Oxbridge graduate, brilliant genius to achieve something in the purposes of God. Praise God, and I need to say on record, praise God for Oxbridge graduates. I better say that coming from Oxford. But I'm not one of them. And it doesn't limit us in the purposes of God. So what are some of those natural fleshly conditions that all of us seem to be born with that somehow, when we gain more of a sense of the courage of God, they dis get displaced out by something stronger in God? The opposite of courage is cowardice, fearfulness, feebleness, and timidity. The opposite of courage, cowardice, fearfulness, feebleness, and timidity. So when we come to Christ and we receive the work of the Holy Spirit, the things that get displaced look and feel like cowardice, feel fearfulness, feebleness, and timidity. So I think part of our curse of sin is our kind of relentless covenant with fear. Naturally speaking, without Jesus helping us, all of us become quite fearful people, whether we want to accept that or admit it or not. Fear of failure. Fear of missing out. Fear of being exposed or ashamed. Fear expressed as insecurity. How I look, how I sound, how I come across to other people. Maybe fear expressed as social anxiety. Do they like me? Do I really fit in? Why am I so lonely? Why do I have few friends? Why am I still single? Am I still accepted? Does anybody really like me? Can I be fully myself? There are a thousand fears that we carry in our humanity linked to inadequacy. Fear, materially. Do I have enough? Do I have too much? I have anxiety about not having enough. Or I have a bit of embarrassment about having too much. Can I survive on this? Fear in our relationship with God. Does he really love me? Am I really forgiven? Is this real? Am I the only one who has doubts? What about fear expressed in guilt? If only they knew what I was really like, they wouldn't like me. If only they knew what I'd done this week, they wouldn't want me. If only they knew what I really thought, they wouldn't be my friend. All of us, have a life existence riddled with some kind of background anxiety and fear. The good news, brothers and sisters, is this. As we come to Christ, gospel courage displaces these human tendencies. So rather than having this kind of soup of insecurities and fearfulness, as the grace of God kind of kicks in more and more, we gain a new courage and a new boldness that dispels some of those weaknesses. I want you to listen to me read 1 John 4 verse 18. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not yet been perfected in love. And we love because he first loved us. Why, why do Christians, why do we as those who are plugged into God, living for Jesus, why do we still carry such fearfulness, anxiety? Why does that happen? Just want to encourage us and say, listen, 
if there's elements in us that still fear this punishment, there's more of the love of God for us to experience. True love casts out all fear. And that sense of fear comes from a sense of punishment. I'm not fully forgiven. I've still, I'm still going to be held accountable for this. I'm not out of the woods. Jesus hasn't quite done enough. I want to tell you, Jesus has done enough. And there is a work through the cross of gospel courage that displaces this kind of fearfulness. So secondly, what is it? Biblical courage. We know accepting that it is the absence of fear. What, what is it really that I'm encouraging us to consider? I just want to say, we've got to remember, haven't we, that our life in Christ is basically restoring to us everything the Father intended right from the beginning. So when we come to Christ, we give our lives to him, we kind of are restored to the original manufacturer's settings. Everything God intended for us in our humanity from the beginning gets restored through Christ. He says Jesus breaks the curse of sin that previously has controlled our lives and he releases us to live in a new way. We say to be born again, as the scriptures say. To live the life we were really created to enjoy. And becoming a Christian is walking the journey of learning to be more and more the person that Jesus has died for you to be. So biblical courage really is to be viewed as the kind of human norm. God wants everybody to live like this. He wants everybody to be free of insecurity and anxiety and fear and inner timidity and senses of rejection and loneliness. He wants all of that gone through the work of his dear son. We are built for this kind of gospel security and courage. Perhaps that's why so often, even in our kind of flesh, when we do something that's kind of really courageous, when we overcome our fear and do something scary, it exhilarates us, doesn't it? Anybody in the room done a kind of a, a parachute jump? Anybody done that? How did it feel? I did go, don't tell me it went well, otherwise the illustration is dead. <laughs> All right. You know, you get to the bottom and you go, again, again, I want to do it again. Because there's something in us that you recognise we are built to be full of courage, not full of fear. So I had a go at writing a definition of what I believe biblical courage is and why it's important. This is Matt Partridge's definition. You ready? Biblical courage is the change of both internal attitudes and external behaviours as the born-again believer understands and accepts they are now eternally and securely rooted in the love of God and are no longer destined for punishment. This understanding overcomes the lifelong tendency to fear and insecurity and leads the Christian towards a life of growing confidence, courage, security, love, acceptance and boldness. The transition from fear to courage affects every area for the Christian. From self-esteem, social anxiety, sense of failure, feelings of not doing or being enough, all the way to fresh boldness in evangelism and mission. And when this penny drops, nothing stays the same. We begin to live a new kind of life when we recognise Jesus has overcome our weakness and we're not destined for punishment so before we go on I just want to speak life into every heart here really if there's a part of you that recognises what I'm describing and inwardly you carry low level insecurity, anxiety about whether you're enough senses of being inadequate or failure, or whatever it, whatever it is you're carrying. I just want to say to you, as you fully accept that Jesus has paid the price for everything, no longer fearing any shadow of punishment, there is a work by the grace of God, a gospel courage that kind of releases us from those lifelong fears. 
So how do we get it? Okay, how do we walk in greater gospel courage? I mean, first, I just want to make a few points of application and we're going to pray together in a minute or two. Firstly, receive the love of God. Now that may sound very strange. You think this is not been a Christian for 30 years, 40 years, longer perhaps, you know? But it's important that we continue to receive the love of God. In my own prayer life, my own devotional life, it's very, very simple, you know? If you ever with me praying, I'll be, God, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you're for me. I thank you that your grace is enough for me. I thank you by your grace I am what I am. Because I'm trying the whole time to rehearse that my security and my identity is fully established in God. If it's established in me, I'm going to be riven with senses of failure and inadequacy and underachievement for my whole life. Do you know why? Because I am an underachiever. But it doesn't matter. Because that isn't where my sense of identity is rooted. It's in Christ. And he isn't an underachiever. So let's receive the love of God. 1 John 4, I read it a moment ago, but let me read it again. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not yet been perfected in love. So we're going to pray in a minute or two and open our lives to receive the more of the love of God. Amen? Number two, this is vital, receive the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says this, But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So straight away, Right there in Acts 2, it's, in John 14, it's linking a work of the Holy Spirit to an absence of fear. And it says in Acts 2 as well, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues, and they continued, it says, to speak the word of God with, God with boldness. Finally, I'd say we need to make a decision, it's what we want. You know, the Bible isn't kind of spooky and mystical about gospel courage, how to overcome our fears. It just says, be courageous. It doesn't say, seek God for the gift of courage. You know, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned it. He's given some to be courageous, some to be apostles, some to... It doesn't say that. Whenever courage is mentioned, almost universally, it says, be. Be courageous. It's like a decision, turn the switch on, make a decision that you're not going to let your own fears dictate your lifestyle and behaviors. There's something bigger and far more magnificent for us. It's the love of God casting out fear and giving us gospel courage. As we do that, we begin to live a different kind of life. What are the kind of things, what kind of difference will it make in our lives? What kind of changes do you think we can anticipate as we go for it. Number one, I would say it equips us to face sin and confess sin to one another. Nothing stops the confession of sin more than fearing punishment. Fearing punishment drives us to hide sin like naughty children. I can remember staying with a family friend when my parents were away travelling, playing table tennis with my sister, and knocking a vase off of a windowsill in our posh friend's house, and it breaking, and I can remember hiding it under the sideboard, rather than saying, I'm sorry, Auntie Cynthia, do you have an Auntie Cynthia? I've broken your vase. Because I fear punishment. So why do Christians 
in the UK in particular, they struggle with confessing sin to one another. Because it's not just about punishment from God, it's about social consequences from one another. I can't tell them that I'm battling with that. They'll never view me in the same light again. You say, hang on, true love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. So the culture we're building in our church here, and in Oxford, is that actually we must confess sin to one another without fear of reprisal or of any kind of conditional response. You know, the best way to respond to a friend confessing sin is to say that it's so inspiring for you to confess that to me. Because to be honest, I battle with similar things in such similar ways. Let's pray for one another together. That's a beautiful response. What isn't is the folding arms and the intake of breath and the, I have no idea you struggle with that. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. So number one, I think if we work this one out, it equips us to face sin and confess it to one another. <coughs> 1 John 1 verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay. okay, number two, it enables us to overcome the world. 1 John 4, 11 children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Okay? Do you know our world needs overcoming? In the UK, there's this massive pressure for us to somehow comply and accept the social and cultural drift of the generation you happen to be living in at the time. That somehow that is contextualised mission. But every war has a front line somewhere that you're not willing to forego. I think it's time for us in the UK to remember actually that we're called to suffer for the gospel and that what's going to motivate us to actually withstand and say, no, I believe in a different way of life actually. Uh, my, my, my life has lived to a completely different set of values to the one that you're describing. I'm living for Jesus, actually. That, that only comes when you have no longer, you're no longer fear of punishment. Our friend in Pakistan, 33 years old, he said, I, I, I don't care what happens to me with my life while we were away last week. 33, married, two children. As soon as you got to the point where fear no longer dominates you, you can do anything for Jesus. <laughs> in the UK, we've got some work to do on overcoming our fears, even socially, in the world. We won't withstand cultural drift, faith called down, dilution of our gospel values. I just want to cry out to you in the younger generation. Like you guys have got such work to do, such faith muscle to build as those who are receiving the baton of the gospel in your generation, you are not going to pull it off without gospel courage. The world has a habit of just moulding us into its shape. And all the time there's this compliance agenda saying, yeah, no, that's kind of contextualised, it's kind of cool. It isn't cool. What's cool is saying, Jesus, what do you want me to live for and stand for in my generation? There are moments Elijah, he said, I'm the last leaf on the tree. I'm the last one speaking truth. That's all it takes. God doesn't need a majority. He needs faithfulness. That's how generations are saved and restored and redeemed. Okay, thirdly, it helps us to serve, putting love into action. I'll speed things up. It helps us overcome all the fears that we spoke about. Keeps us generous with our time, gifts, and money. If we haven't really got our lives rooted into a sense of gospel courage, it's hard, hard to give stuff away. It's hard to give our time away because it feels too costly. It's hard to give our money away it feels too costly. It's hard to give our gifts away. It keeps us bold to speak and share about Jesus with other people. It stops us being secret Christians, fearing reprisals in our work communities or student communities. Gospel courage is genuinely transformational. Okay? So I, I'm just going to spend the rest of the time because I'm going to just praying. I, I would love to receive prayer as well. 
I just want to encourage you, if you have kind of sensed God speaking to you, like his hand on your life as I've been speaking, if you know that you carry some of these insecurities, anxieties, the good news is, friends, we don't have to drag them around like excess hand luggage for the rest of our lives. Okay? None of us are prisoners to our personalities, all our experiences, when we're actually living for Christ. Okay? So if you want to receive the word of God today, we're going to pray together, see what the Holy Spirit does. Just stand where you're at, and I'm going to pray.